On the eve of the big vote in the Portuguese parliament, I'm talking here with Catarina Principe, an activist, a socialist from the left bloc, uh, who we spoke to before some months ago prior to the Portuguese elections. Well, these elections have taken place and all the indications are uh, in the media, both the centre media and the right-wing media, that a new government will be formed consisting of an alliance between the Socialist Party and the groups on the left, the Left Bloc, the Portuguese Communist Party and the Greens, which have collectively enough votes to get rid of the right-wing government. But right and left can be interchangeable words as far as the principal parties of the European Centre are concerned. Welcome again. The last time we spoke, uh, we were both a bit pessimistic that the parties of the left, left of the centre, uh, might not do so well because the opinion polls were showing a sort of lower vote and the parties had been in decline during the last election. But this didn't happen. And everyone was surprised and pleased that the left bloc and the PCP and the Greens had done so well. So could you just take us through what happened concretely during the elections? Um, so I think what happened, so the electoral results can be explained, I would say maybe in three parts. One is, so we, were, we, were, we also were not expecting the right wing to win again. I remember when we talked last time, our expectation was that the Socialist Party would come first, right? Yes. So I think what happened, on the one hand, um, the reasons for the right to win again um, are interesting ones. Um, the, first, they did a very smart electoral campaign a non-confrontational electoral campaign where then they didn't actually want to discuss anything about the future and they center their narrative on the fact that they did not have to ask for a second bailout yet. Which is a very important thing because why didn't they have to ask for a second bailout? Well, the, the European Central Bank, some months before the elections, uh, applied what they call the public purchase program which buys directly Portuguese debt in, in order to lower the interest rates so that the, Port the Portuguese government could pass the last evaluation of the Troika and therefore did not have the need to ask for a second bailout. I would like to remember that this never happened with Greece. Greece no. was never allowed to get direct help from the European Central Bank. And so, because we didn't have to ask for a second bailout, the right wing was able to build on the narrative of the worthiness of our sacrifices. So, the last four years were very difficult, we had to do a lot of sacrifices, but they were worth it, the Troika is away, we don't need them anymore. So I think this gave them some sort of like flair of like, okay, this is good, something is going right, so why change? It's paid off. Our yes, policies it's paid, are off. paid off. Exactly. So they built very strongly on this narrative, which I think was a, um, a very strong reason for them to have won again. Um, at the same time, and this is maybe the second reason, um, on the contrary of what we were expecting, uh, the Socialist Party did a very bad electoral campaign. But at the political level, they clearly had a problem because, uh, as we talked about last time also, um, they tried to build their uh, political discourse in the last years around being an oppositional party that is critical to austerity. But the problem is that their electoral program was not that different from the one from the right. So the failure of the Socialist Party in like doing a strong uh, campaign also um, like emptied their space, so people just also voted for the left. Um, so on the one hand, we have the right doing a very good, strong political campaign uh, of the worthiness of our sacrifices, and we did it well. The Socialist Party disappearing uh, politically from the space of the electoral dispute, so a lot of people just decided to vote for the left. I think what explains the also the results of the left bloc are uh, a couple of things. Um, I think we did a very good campaign 
publicly, uh, our public figures, our spokesperson, um, they did very good publicly on, for example, all the um, television debates between the leaders of the parties. Even the mainstream press said that Katarina, our spokesperson, she won all of the debates. So she was very well prepared. She uh, is capable of communicating complex ideas with a simple language that people understand. That's actually what we heard a lot on the streets. People telling her, I understand what you are saying. Um, so we did a very good campaign on the streets, but also we, we were able to use the media in a very good way because of the, the role that Katarina and other figures were playing. Um, and because of this, we were capable of bringing into the center of the discussion the really important questions, uh, which of course are the questions of austerity. But if we talk about austerity just like this, it sometimes can seem a little bit too abstract. Mm. So what we were talking about very clearly was about employment mm. and labor as a central question of our campaign and in a way as a means to solve all the problems that people face. So how do we solve unemployment, we create jobs. How do we stop migration? We create jobs. Uh, how do we refund and sustain social security and the welfare state? Well, that's only possible if we create jobs so that people can contribute to an intergenerational solidarity uh, uh, structure as the social uh, security system. Um, so you argued <coughs> for more yes. investment. Investment and, 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 and a program of job creating, better wages to rise the, the, the wages, have a better minimum wage. Uh, we talked about pensions very much, which is a very complicated question in Portugal right now because a lot of our pensionists have very, very low pensions. So a lot of people live, live under the poverty level. So rising the pensions again, they had been frozen in the last year. So unfreeze the pensions, rising the pensions. This is a central question also. The question of migration was also, we talked about this also the last time I was here. Portugal has witnessed the biggest migration wave in its history, even bigger than the one uh, during the dictatorship in the 60s. So almost uh, 600,000 people have left the country already in the last years. So to talk about migration was also a very important thing because there's no one who has someone that you know that ha left mm. the country. Um, so I think we did a very good thing, uh, a very good uh, campaign on the political level. Also something that I would like to add, which I find a very important political opening, was how we dealt with the question of Syriza. We were very worried about it because um, Syriza winning the elections in January was of course a political Model. opening yes. for us. But the capitulation demoralized the, large numbers exactly, of people. Exactly. That the fact that they signed the memorandum, the third memorandum, meant for us, uh, or the, the, the other parties were kind of, um, how do you say this, not threatening, um, accusing us of ac accusing Bloco, which is of course the sister organization of Syriza in Portugal, or is seen as the sister organization of Syriza in Portugal. Uh, people were accusing Bloco of uh, look what happened in Greece. If Syriza is not capable of applying anti-austerity measures, so of course you are not going to be able. So austerity is inevitable. What you're proposing is impossible. And look at Tsipras, even he had to sign a memorandum. So we were very worried that this would play a very negative role in our campaign of like basically saying that there are no alternatives and that Bloco is not a credible alternative because if you look at Greece, even a party on the left that wins the elections is not Can't capable. Can't do anything. Exactly. And I think we were capable of dealing with this in a very um, smart and effective way. So on the one hand, we were able to carve a narrative of saying this is the problem of the European Union that does not accept democracy and democratic decisions, that does not accept sovereign decisions. That argument was made during the campaign? Yes, publicly. But at the same time to say, um, but we would not have signed the memorandum. So if that means we would need to break from the euro, we will. So no more sacrifices for the euro was a very important line during the campaign. This opens, I think, a political space for us, but also a political space for the left in Europe in general. 
because the narrative we heard from Greece was it's impossible for any left force to gain any kind of electoral, uh, positive electoral results if they have a more eurocritical perspective. Well, we proved the contrary. We made a narrative around no more sacrifices for the euro, saying we would not sign a memorandum, and still we got the best result ever. So I think this is an opening of a political space that I find a very, very important one. And, and uh, what was the line of the Communist Party? The line of the Communist Party has always been the same. They are Eurosceptical, Eurocritical. Their uh, line for the election is uh, uh, around a patriotic left government. Uh, so they are, as they always were, uh, willing and determined to leaving both the Euro and the EU. So at the moment we have almost 18.5, so almost 20% of the Portuguese parliament is constituted by Eurosceptical and Eurocritical forces. Well, this is forces. very positive because yes. this is being done by the left yes. and not by an extreme right. Group. Exactly. We have n the the right in Portugal is not Eurocritical um, because the far right in Portugal is almost inexistent. Okay, so we have this election result, which is quite remarkable and very positive, and then the president of Portugal makes a fool of himself <laughs> by not even consulting the other parties and assuming that the party with the largest number of votes uh, in parliament, not largest number of members of parliament, is automatically entitled to form the next government. Yes, um, so there's a, um, there's a very concrete problem with this parliament. Um, uh, so minority governments have existed in of Portugal course. before yeah. um, and we also don't have a tradition of grand coalitions which is important to say. There is no tradition that the president appoints the, the second most voted party to form government. So I think that also explains why he had this space of maneuvering. But the problem is we are gonna have um, presidential elections in January uh, and the, according to the Portuguese constitution the President of the Republic cannot dissolve a parliament in his last six months, in the last six months of his mandate. And a parliament cannot dissolve itself in the first six months of ah. its existence. So this parliament has to have a government. Has to have a government. Yeah. <laughs> uh, unless the president decides to um, appoint a caretaker government, which is still a possibility on the table. Um, so uh, what he did was uh, he appointed the leader of the right-wing party, mm -hmm. which is a leader of his party, yes. to form government. Um, and what I think is interesting on what happened at that moment was what he said. So uh, when he spoke to the Portuguese people about why he was appointing uh, the leader of the right-wing to form a government, um, he didn't only say it's because they were the most voted party. He also used that. The European links with Europe. Yes, that was his central argument, was that he was not uh, going to appoint. The, so once the elections happened, the Socialist Party, the Left Bloc and the Communist Party started a process of negotiation to, um, so we, on Parliament, when we, will, or when we vote in favor of a government, we can allow a government. So we give a confidence vote yes. to a certain party so yeah. that they try to form a government. But actually, no government can be, can be actually um, formed. formed without the approval of a state budget. So this is what we're discussing. These are the negotiations that have been going on. It's about the central lines for a state budget for the next year. Because if we, we can vote in favor of a, of a party or of a government on parliament, but if we vote against the state budget, the government the falls. government falls. So uh, what the left and the Socialist Party tried to do was to present to the president of the republic um, an alternative to the formation of a right-wing government, saying we are willing to make an agreement with the Socialist Party to find a way to vote a um, state budget together for the next year uh, and this will give us a majority on parliament. 
He decided against it and he decided to give the opportunity to the right wing to form government by stating the irresponsibility of the Socialist Party for trying to form a government with Eurocritical and Eurosceptical forces. Yes. That in a moment where, after the, uh, after the crisis, where we are so dependent on the European institutions, that it would be an irresponsibility and something that he will not do to appoint a government that uh, is supported by people, by parties and people that um, are against the participation of Portugal in NATO, that are against the European Fiscal Compact, that want to negotiate and restructure the debt. So basically what he said was that the democratic processes in Portugal are not as important as the dictates of the European institutions. Yes, he was basically on the Cyprus line, effectively. <laughs> I mean, if we can put it like that. So now what is going on? <coughs> I mean, we are speaking on the eve of the vote. Yes. Tomorrow there will be a vote. The optimistic side of this is that the Conservative government will be defeated in the vote unless a number of socialist members of parliament angry with what's been going on decide to vote for them. But how many socialist members of parliament voting for the right would it take for the government to win? Only nine. Nine. Mm -hmm. So they must be working very hard to try and win nine members over. I think so. Um, yeah, because, you know, as Socrates has shown, many Socialist Party members are for sale. They can be bought. Yes. Uh, let's hope it doesn't happen. And let's go to the other alternative, which is certainly better, but which has its problems. Let me put the problems to you like this. Let's assume that the right government falls, the Socialist Party are uh, asked to form a government in agreement with the left bloc and the Communist Party. First question to you, will the left bloc and the Communist Party be part of this government in the sense of having ministers in the cabinet? No. 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 So the, the agreement is simply that the left bloc and the Communist Party will not allow this government to be defeated in Parliament as long as it adheres to the agreement. Precisely. Right. Now, let us suppose that halfway into the new government, if it is formed, there is huge pressure from Europe saying some of the things that you have agreed are not acceptable because these could produce another crisis and we are not prepared to tolerate them, then what? That is the difficult question. So um, just to go back a little bit, uh, these are the three things that we need to come with, together with the Socialist Party that they have to accept from us in order for us to allow a government on Parliament. Um, these three ideas are uh, that we will stop the flexibilization of the labor market, mm. Uh, so no more easy firing, mm. that uh, we will um, unfreeze the pensions mm. and uh, that we will stop a proposal from the Socialist Party to lower um, a taxation level on employers and employees. Mm. Plus one a thing that wasn't in the first three but then was included, which was already accepted by the Constitutional Court before the elections, which is to give back the wages that were cut in the last year during 2016. So this was also part of the negotiations. According to the document that has now been signed and approved by Bloco, the Socialist Party um, and, the and the Communist Party, okay, I'm gonna be very honest and this is my opinion. We were not expecting uh, that the Socialist Party would agree. Would agree. So we put forward these three ideas based on, let's say, three wrong assumptions. The assumption that we were going to do bad in the elections, the assumption that the Socialist Party was going to win, and uh, the assumption that they would want to negotiate with us. So um, we thought that they would not want to negotiate with us and that they would go with the right. This was the expectation until uh, three days after the elections. We put forward these three ideas. Mm -hmm. um, we know 
that this all the all the budgeting uh, is not fully possible if we don't renegotiate the debt. That's obvious. Yeah. So um, we know that, and of course, the Socialist Party does not want to, to renegotiate to renegotiate or restructure the debt. Yeah. They want to create a working group to talk about it. Yeah, for a year. Or for a year yeah. or two or whatever, and yeah. they don't want to confront the European institutions on it. So. What I think is we need to do this agreement. This was our proposal, so we need to go on with it. And we need to answer to the feeling that people have, a lot of people on the streets have of, we need to get rid of the right, and we need to give people um, some time and some space to breathe, which is a, a, a very important feeling. Um, but we also need to be careful. We need to make sure that we know where our boundaries are. And to be sure and to be very clear that we know that we are not govern, governing with our program. They are governing with their program. We're just supporting them on Parliament. I understand all that, Katharina, but in my opinion, it should have been possible both for the left bloc and the Portuguese Communist Party to say to them, you have your program, we can agree to support you if you carry out these measures, but that's all. We will, as independent parties in the parliament, wait and see. <clears throat> we give you six months to start on these measures, and if not, we will return to the people who elected us and tell them what's going on. I tell you this returning to the people who elected us concept is a very obvious yeah. one. Mm -hmm. This is what Syriza did not do in Greece. After the first meeting in Berlin, where Tsipras and Varoufakis were told very clearly, no deal with you guys. They came home and pretended they had won a triumph because the Troika was now going to be call itself the institutions. Instead of calling a mass meeting of their supporters, mass assemblies in the cities and saying, they are saying no. Mm -hmm. We're going to fight back, we need your support, but they're going to say no. Instead, the maneuvering began and the lies and the deceptions, and finally, Syriza imploded. So, you're not doing that, and that's very important. <clears throat> but nonetheless, this link between what you're doing in Parliament and assemblies, calling assemblies on the streets to talk to your supporters and others, I think this is a crucial dialectic of politics today for the left. If they get totally caught up in parliamentary maneuvers, it's not going to do them any good, and they have to tell the truth, however unpalatable it is, saying this is what's happening, this is what we are doing, this is what the socialists say, this is what our view is, and make sure that they keep this, have a public debate and discussion on it, good or bad. Um, <clears throat> I could not agree more. <laughs> um, um, I just I want to say something about what happened in 2011. Um, in 2011, we had a, mi a minority government of the Socialist Party with Socrates as a prime minister. The government fell because they wanted to apply a fourth austerity package even before the Troika. Um, so there was a censorship motion to the government on parliament where Bloco voted or the right voted with Bloco. We voted together against this austerity package. We were, um, 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 people attributed as the responsibility for the comeback of the right mm. in the elections of 2011. Because they said, you were the ones that because you voted against this government that created the conditions for the right to come back. I think we should not have done differently. We did it correctly. I think you did right. We did it correctly, yeah. but we lost electoral support. And I don't think that's the most important no. thing. So I, I, I think that we are in a difficult position right now. I think we are doing what we must do at this moment, but we're in a difficult position. Because if the Socialist Party in six months needs a corrective budget, which they will, because we know they will, because there will be probably a bank that is gonna go bankrupt in the next month, uh, there will be some European directives about deficit spending, 
and so on and so forth. So there will be the need of a corrective budget. And we need to make sure that we know that the moment when they start applying austerity, we have to break this deal. Yeah. Because we are independent on Parliament. We are not joining the government, so we are independent on Parliament. And we are only discussing the state budget for this year, not even for the next years. Mm. So we keep, this, is a, this is an important thing. We keep our independence from compromising too much. And at the same time, we need to be very clear and have a collective discussion about where do we break. In my opinion, at any moment where the Socialist Party says, oh, after all, what we said in the agreement cannot be completely fulfilled, we need to break. We will always lose, because if we break, if the right wing comes back in power, it will be our fault. If we break, and even if the right wing does not come back in power immediately, it will still be our fault. Um, less so about the Communist Party, because they have a very stable basis of support mm. for a hundred years. What you were saying about the movement, yeah. uh, I totally agree. Actually, the last national leadership meeting of Bloco approved in its political resolution to start calling for public assemblies on all levels and all parts of the country, precisely to discuss what can we do. To, because the reason why we were so surprised about this electoral outcome. It's because first, Bloco has not actually built in the last years a strong social implementation. And also because this is not a translation or a reflection of a big moment of contestation on the streets. No. No. So that's why we were so surprised because nothing indicated that the left would have so, 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 so good results. So this is definitely what we have to be prioritizing. It's to build a movement on the streets that uh, is against austerity, that is willing and able to defend the gains that the left is trying to win with all this negotiational process, so that we manage that even if um, there will be new elections, let's say in a year, even if we drop electorally, we have um, yeah. used the instruments and this political moment in order to actually build more roots and to spark again social <coughs> mobilizations that um, are clear against, clearly against austerity and that can live on no matter what the political circumstances are. I, I think this is extremely important and I think also that if you begin to organize general assemblies, at least for a start in all the areas where you have won support and been elected, including, of course, especially in, 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 in Lisbon, mm -hmm. uh, even if the number of people who come to a general assembly are 100 or 60 or 70, though I think there will be more, yes. What now can be done through technology, which is very good, is you can have a podcast so people not able to come to the meeting can see it then yes. or see it later. And this communication between the elected and the electors and those who didn't bother to vote becomes extremely important in the coming period. Uh, so I, let, let us hope that that happens. Because, Katrina, yes. there is no doubt that the shameful capitulation of Syriza uh, to the European Union has demoralized large numbers of people. In Greece itself, they won the election because people didn't want to vote for the right. But 44% of the people didn't vote at all. 43 in Portugal. 43 point? In, po in Portugal. Yeah. So there is a very big, and I, I want to strengthen this idea, 43% uh, of the people did not vote in Portugal. Even in this election. 43, this election. This is 43% of the people that are completely fed up and cynical and disappointed about this political system. We need to be talking to these people. On that happy note, and let's <laughs> hope that something good <laughs> happens in Portugal. Katharina, and we will return to it in six months' time. Thank you. Thank you.